Hello and welcome to the second event of the Democracy Matter series. And thank you everyone for joining us. I'm Rana Bramitsky, a professor of economics here at Stanford. And I'm delighted that we are joined today by hundreds of faculty, staff, alumni, and students, including 300 undergraduate students who are taking this event series as a course. You cannot have an event series called Democracy Matters and not mention the passing of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, a giant of the Supreme Court, an incredible woman who inspired generations of people around the world, a leading light in the fight against gender discrimination and for equal rights under the law. Uh, may her memory be a blessing to all of us who believe that democracy matters. Uh, last week, we talked about challenges facing democracy in the US. We will devote the next two weeks to talk about some of the challenges posed by COVID-19 and think about what policymakers can do about them. Today, we will talk about the challenges of COVID-19 to the 2020 elections, to polarization, to public health, and to the environment. And next week, we will talk about COVID and how it is changing the economy. Of course, there is no way to cover everything we know about the pandemic in one or two webinars. So just think about today's event as four all-star scholars who have explored some important aspects of uh, the impacts of COVID-19. I'm hoping that this event will trigger your interest and maybe even encourage you to get involved with the important research done here at Stanford on various aspects of COVID. As is often the case with the, the incredible people in this university, the Stanford research community has risen up to the challenge. I'm so impressed uh, with my Stanford colleagues and how many of them shifted their focus uh, to the pandemic crisis as soon as it started spreading. Stanford is aiming to provide intellectual leadership during this moment of crisis, and there's a lot of effort around here devoted to research coordination and collaboration around this common challenge. There is also an effort to showcase the research done by Stanford community on COVID-19, and you can find dedicated pages on the websites of the university at large, the School of HNS, the Medical School, and Stanford's Institute for Economic Policy Research. And I will make the links to some of these resources available after the event. Today, I'm very honored to have four fantastic colleagues from four different fields. I asked Pamela Carlan from the law school to talk about COVID-19 and the 2020 elections. I asked Matt Jensko from economics to discuss polarization and public health. Erin Mordecai from biology will discuss long-term intervention strategies for COVID-19. And Marshall Burke from earth, science, uh, earth system science will talk about pandemic and air pollution. All four of them are remarkable examples of scholars who have refocused their research to address the challenges posed by the pandemic and all with an eye towards being useful to the general public. Uh, each speaker will, have, uh, will give a 10 minutes presentation and we will follow with Q&A. Please feel free to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to ask your questions and we will pose as many of them as possible to the panelists at the end of the presentations. So, our first speaker today is Pamela Carlan. Uh, Pam is the Kenneth and Harl Montgomery Professor of Public Interest Law at Stanford. She is the co-director of the Law School's Supreme Court Litigation Clinic, where students litigate live cases before the court. Uh, Pamela is a prolific scholar and an award-winning teacher. She's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Academy of Appellate, Law uh, Appellate Lawyers, and the American Law Institute. Uh, Pam is one of the nation's leading experts on voting and the political process. She has served as a commissioner to the California Fair Political Practices Commission and as an assistant counsel for the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. And in 2013, Pam was appointed by the Obama administration to serve as the US Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the Civil Rights Division of the US Department of Justice. When she was there, Pam received the Attorney General's Award for Exceptional Service, the department's highest award for employee performance for her role in implementing the Supreme Court's decision in United States versus Windsor. So welcome, Pamela, and thanks very much for joining us today. So thank you, first of all, Ron, for putting this together and for having me. Um, really looking forward to learning from my colleagues and sharing some of the work and thoughts that we've been doing. So what I'm going to be talking about is the kind of before, during, and after problem of voting in the era of COVID. And the real problem is that huge numbers of voters usually go to the polls on election day, stand in long lines, and cast their ballots. But in this election, 
there's going to be a lot going on that will change how voters vote, how votes get counted, how the results get reported, and all of that is really important to understanding the election we're going to be having. So we're in a constantly changing landscape. In March, which is what the slide on the left shows you, uh, those, there were not that many states that were letting people vote by mail uh, absolutely, that is just sending people ballots. That has changed by August. So that now 21% of voters in America are going to be receiving ballots in the mail from their election authorities. And really about 80% of Americans are going to be able to vote by mail. That's really quite different than normal. And you can get a little bit of a sense of this as I talk about some of the solutions to the problem of how do we vote in COVID. So the first is we have to move to mail voting wherever that's possible to try in, in a sense of flattening the curve of how many people are going to be trying to vote on election day itself. We also have to retrofit polling places to make sure that they're safe. Uh, and that's going to take some real efforts as well. And we need to think about having as many people vote early, either by mail or in person as possible. And this all is not as easy as people think, because the election system is very complex in the United States. It's run at the county level by 3,000 different counties. That is, it's not run by the national government. It's not even really run on a day-to-day -day basis by the state governments. Um, and there are a lot of options, and I just want everybody to understand that those options really run from uh, states sending people the ballots by mail to election centers uh, and the like. So let me show you a little bit of what's going on. The first thing to understand is be, that states are really different in how many people vote by mail and how equipped the state is to run vote by mail. So for, at one end of the spectrum, Washington State and Oregon have been voting by mail for years. 98.98% plus of voters in those states will cast ballots that they receive in the mail. At the other end, Pennsylvania in the 2018 election uh, only had 5.1% of its voters vote by mail. But in the primary elections this spring, they saw six times as many voters voting by mail. And there's a lot that a jurisdiction has to do to prepare for vote by mail. It's a little more complex than voting at the polls because the envelopes come back and they have to be opened. The votes have to be processed before they can be tabulated. And in some states that can't begin till election day. And I'll talk in a moment about why that's a problem. So what are the concerns that people have with vote by mail? Well, if you listen to our president, he's worried about fraud. I actually think there's very little evidence of serious fraud in vote by mail, but it can occur. The way states handle this is by having a traceable ballot system and by checking the signatures of voters when they return their absentee ballot against the signatures that are on file for the voter uh, at the time the voter registered. So fraud is a concern, but I think not really a major one. The bigger concern is disenfranchisement, that people actually won't be able to cast a ballot and have it counted. Either they'll fail to receive the ballot, and that can happen in part in COVID because people are not living in the place where they're registered to vote uh, and they won't receive a ballot by mail uh, or postal service problems, and you've probably been hearing a lot about those. The second kind of error involves errors in casting the ballot. Uh, when you go to a polling place, they hand you a ballot, you fill it out, you hand it in. But when you vote by mail, you often have to, in some states, have witnesses uh, to the ballot. Uh, in almost every state, you have to sign the outer envelope. In some states, you also have to add your birth date or other identifying information. And people forget to do this kind of thing. And then there's a problem with their ballot. Or there can be errors in rejecting the ballots. That is, the state, uh, the state tabulators may make a mistake and think that somebody didn't fill out things properly on their ballot. Uh, and the other thing is that there can be a discriminatory impact from this. The more, uh, the more uh, experienced you are as a voter and the wealthier and more educated you are as a voter, the more likely you are to effectively follow the directions and get your ballot back in. So that's voting by mail. But lots of Americans, for a lot of reasons, are going to want to vote at a polling place. And here we have three real sets of challenges, people, places, and things. The people problem is that most of the poll workers in the United States tend to be elderly. Most of them are over the age of 60. And that's a group of people who are particularly vulnerable to COVID and therefore particularly unlikely to volunteer in this election. If you're interested in being a poll worker, power the polls 
is a nationwide organization that will tell you how to become a poll worker in your state. Um, and so you need to have specialized training for these people so that they treat voters uh, properly at the polls, and that takes time and effort. The places are a problem as well, because, for example, schools are unlikely to want to have large numbers of people coming through them. So there are fewer facilities that are willing to be polling places and uh, that are suitable to be polling places. And on top of that, you need to make sure that the voting machines are disinfected between voters. And that means the lines may well be longer. So what's the most important resource in this coming election? The most important resource is time. People need more time to vote, and voting has already begun in a large number of states, which is all to the good. It'll take more time to administer the election. And then, and this is something I want to highlight for you, it will take more time to count the votes because uh, ballots that are cast by mail have to be processed before they can be put in to tabulation machines. And therefore, it will take more time to announce the results. So I've talked to you about before election day, during election day, and now I want to talk a little bit about after election day. Because it's going to take longer to count the votes, one of the things that a lot of uh, scholars are predicting is a political complication that can be summarized as the red mirage and the blue wave. Uh, more Democrats are likely to vote by mail, and they're likely to vote later in the process uh, than Republicans. So on election night, uh, there's every probability that in many places the Republican candidate will be ahead because only the votes that were cast at the polls will have been tabulated. But as more votes come in, and in California, for example, you can, as long as your ballot is postmarked by election day, uh, it can arrive up to 17 days after the election, there's going to be what's called the blue wave. And this may cause all kinds of uncertainty um, uh, and uh, all kinds of problems in the um, uh, reporting of the election, uh, and it may lead to some kinds of litigation. So I want to thank you for listening to me and say, uh, if you're eligible to vote, which I think this may be the first election for a number of our undergraduates, uh, please be sure to cast your vote so that you'll be counted. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Pam, for this insightful talk. And it, today our next speaker is my good friend, Matthew Jensko. Uh, Matt is a professor of economics at Stanford. He is the world expert on media economics and have made fundamental contributions to our understanding of media bias and the effect of media on society, among many other questions. Matt is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the Econometric Society, a senior fellow at the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research, and a former co-editor of the American economic journal Applied Economics. Matt is also an award-winning teacher, and he is a wonderful colleague at the economics department. Matt has received too many awards to be mentioning here, but I will mention he was awarded the 2014 John Bates Clark Medal given by the American Economic Association to the American economist under the age of 40, who has made the most significant contribution to economic thought and knowledge. And let me just say that the Clark Medal is often a predictor of eventually winning the Nobel Prize. So thanks a lot for joining, Matt. Thanks so much, Ron. Um, and thanks everybody for being here and, and thanks for inviting me to be part of this. It's a really great event. I'm so glad that you all have uh, put in all the effort you did to make it happen because I think it's incredibly important that we're all talking about these issues. Um, so I want to talk quickly about the interaction between the COVID crisis and polarization. Um, and and I, I'd like everybody to kind of rewind in your mind back to the early days of the COVID crisis in the US in, in early March, say. And I, I want you to think about two narratives of what polarization might do or how polarization might interact with the crisis that at that time, I, I think would have both been very plausible. So one is we've been talking about polarization for a long time and the risks of polarization. And one of the things that we've been saying over and over is, we're really going to see the cost of, of the political divisions in this country when the country has to respond to a major crisis. That in times of crisis, we think about war, we think about Pearl Harbor. Those are times where unity coming together, everybody being on the same page, people being willing to step up and do what they need to support the broader public good is incredibly important. And so you might have thought, here's where the rubber's going to hit the road and we're really going to see the costs of, of 
political divisions. There's a very different story, which is when we talk about polarization, one thing people have noted many times is the actual individual stakes in what do you say you believe about climate change or what do you say uh, you think is the right tax policy or what do you say on social media about Donald Trump are pretty low. None of those things actually impact people's lives in, in, in a very immediate way. And in, in, in many contexts, we might think when the stakes actually get high, when push comes to shove, when it really matters for your life, when your life is at stake, maybe these divisions are gonna become smaller. There's lots of evidence in previous crises that there, is, uh, there tends to be a reduction in those divisions when crises occur. And you might think this is gonna be a time where the country is really gonna to pull together and these differences in, yeah, we talk about, you know, I'm more skeptical of science and you're less skeptical of science, but when it, when it comes down to, am I gonna wear a mask or not going outside and my own life is at risk in doing that, those, those differences aren't gonna matter so much. So, We've, we've been along with lots of other people, I think, trying to look at some data and track what really is happening and what, what is the role of polarization and, and political differences in how we have responded so far. So rolling back to that early period, um, very early on, there was survey evidence showing gaps in both how concerned Republicans and Democrats in this country were about the crisis, predictions of how bad they thought it was going to be, Democrats systematically saying that they were more concerned, that they thought it would be worse, and also survey evidence suggesting differences in behavior. Democrats were more likely to say they were taking social distancing measures. Now, in March, if you were looking at these numbers, there are a couple of questions that you might have had. The first is, if you remember, the, the parts of the United States that were hit first in a serious way by COVID were all essentially democratic areas. There were big cities like New York and San Francisco and Seattle, uh, cities on the coast for the most part that were all overwhelmingly democratic. So one question is, are these differences and these sorts of surveys just an artifact of, for obvious reasons, somebody living in Seattle in March was more concerned about COVID than somebody living in uh, Iowa. Second, it's often not clear what to make of these sort of survey responses and how they relate to people's real behavior. Maybe that there's a little bit of kind of political cheerleading and saying, ah, no, 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 I'm not doing social distancing even though people are really doing it. So in, in this, uh, some, of the, some of the work that we were doing at that point was just to see, could we, do two things basically. One, use some, some data which measures directly people's behavior. Um, in this case, we're gonna use smartphone data that has GPS traces of a large sample of people and lets us see how people are really moving around and to what extent are there real differences in the social distancing responses as measured by how much people are leaving home, going out and doing different things. Um, and relate that to, to political composition of different places. Um, and then the other thing, the key thing we wanna do is to the extent possible, adjust for some of these differences like which places had a lot of COVID cases early on and which did not, as well as things like maybe this is a, a, an urban rural difference or um, differences associated with income or education or, or various other characteristics. Um, so here's, here's what the raw data looks like without any of that adjustment, just what the GPS data looks like. So. The, the map in the upper left here is how much social distancing people were doing uh, in, in the early phase of the crisis. So more precisely, how much had, had GPS visits fallen from January to April 6th? And so blue here means people were doing more social distancing, red means they were doing less. The map on the right is just the kind of classic map of Republican vote share in the 2016 election. And something you can see just kind of eyeballing those is there's some correlation. And so indeed places that are more democratic as measured by their presidential vote shares are places where people were doing more social distancing. They're not perfectly correlated, but they kind of move together. The bottom plot shows just the raw time series of social distancing separately by blue counties and red counties. And you see, um, a big drop for both, but a drop that looks like it was bigger for the Democratic counties um, consistent with the maps. That plot also shows you what's happened since, which is that there's been this gradual recovery of activity. So we're back up to levels of people moving around that are maybe 
uh, you know, two thirds of the way back, half of the way back to, to uh, January levels. Okay, so that's without any controls for anything. So it's not, maybe all of what we're seeing here in these maps is just the, new, the Northeast, California, Seattle, those are the hard hit areas. Um, so in our main analysis in ways I'm not gonna go into the details of, we're gonna do our best to control flexibly for virus severity, what state people are in, which is important because it includes among other things, state level policies. And we'll also control for differences in county level policies, population density, age, which is obviously important, economic factors, weather. Um, and all this comes with the caveat that, that this approach of controlling statistically for things is very imperfect. So it doesn't rule out the fact that there's other stuff maybe that is correlated with partisanship, but I think it's, it's gonna help us take out the most obvious um, confounds. And so here's the, here's the main result from that analysis. So what is this plot showing? You see that there are dates on the x-axis, there are dates by week down here, and each red dot shows in that week how big is the gap between Republicans and Democrats in social distancing behavior after we control for all those other factors. So positive numbers here mean that the Democratic counties are doing more social distancing than otherwise similar Republican counties that have the same COVID load, that have um, that are in the same state and so on. And so, um, and the little gray bars here are 95% confidence intervals. So if those don't overlap zero, those differences are significant in the traditional sense. So what you see is basically there is a clear significant partisan gap that opened up uh, in early March and has remained pretty constant uh, since then, perhaps tailing off a little bit as visits have recovered, but the perception that this is that there's differences in, in behavior in red areas and blue areas is not just an artifact of those of those other things. Um, and it's clearly robust to lots of different ways of doing this. Um, now, I, I want to emphasize something kind of on the flip side of that, which is that although those differences are very significant, they are also what I would describe as modest in size. Um, so, I mean, you could sort of see that in, in this figure, just if you think about the, what is the right way to describe this, it is true that there are differences between blue and red, but it's also true that everybody did a lot of social distancing at the beginning. And I think that's true of these, of these um, kind of more careful statistical results as well. This difference boils down to about a 15% gap in how much people have reduced their movement uh, between the most Republican and most Democratic areas of the country. So I think 15% 15 is big enough to matter. It has real health consequences. If we add this up in terms of what is the impact of social distancing on transmission of the virus and what is the impact of that on lives saved, it matters. But it's also not enormous. And it would be incorrect to have the perception that Democrats are doing a ton of social distancing and Republicans are doing none. I think the first order fact is everybody is doing a lot, but there is some difference. Um, we also did a separate survey, which I won't talk about a lot, but which basically replicates this um, and also allowed us to, to try to push a little harder on these differences in beliefs. So we see consistent with the prior survey evidence, Republicans said that they would predict less severity of the crisis going forward. They predicted fewer cases in April. And to kind of push on that a little bit, we gave them incentives. So if you get, if depending on the accuracy of your prediction, you could earn up to $100 from predicting the, the number of coronavirus cases. And you see, actually, you might have thought, well, if there's enough money on the line, these differences would go away and everybody would give the same answer. That's not true. So that, that method has been used in the past and kind of interpreted as evidence that these are real belief differences, like people genuinely have different perceptions of, of the risk. Um, last thing I want to say, uh, and, and then I'll wrap up, all of that is about how is polarization impacting the response to the crisis. And the kind of flip side of that, as I was saying at the beginning, there's also a question of how is the crisis going to impact polarization? And is this going to be driving us further apart? Because now we have another thing to fight about, whether we should be wearing masks or not wearing masks. Um, and so I want to show you just one, this is not in, in our paper, but just a kind of hot off the press data point from some recent survey evidence. 
that we were looking at. Um, so one standard measure of polarization is what's called affective polarization. This goes back to seminal work by Shanto Iyengar, who's at Stanford and co-authors. Um, and, and the key way to think about this is instead of looking at are we polarized in what we think about abortion, or we polarized in what we think about other issues, we want to focus on how do people feel about each other. If you ask Republicans, how do they feel about Democrats, or you ask Democrats, how do they feel about Republicans, how big are the gaps on that measure? And, and this is, has played a really central role in the literature because this is probably the measure where we see most clearly the rise in polarization in recent years. People's issue views, what do you, what do you think the tax rate should be? What do you think about abortion? Those things have not moved all that much, but this kind of feeling measure has moved a lot. Um, so. Let me just show you from, from recent kind of high frequency survey that's been repeated over time, how has effective polarization changed during the crisis? Do you think that the kind of hostility people are feeling has gone up during COVID or gone down during COVID? Kind of imagine which way, which way would you predict if you had to vote right now? What is your guess? Um, this turns out to be the answer. So um, for about as long as we can see and cross-checking it, against various other evidence, I think this is about the right description. Effective polarization has had been roughly constant leading up to the crisis. And what we see is pretty dramatic decline in effective polarization right around the onset of the crisis. Now, this is just a time series. A lot of different things can be bouncing around here. I wouldn't take this as rock solid evidence, but I think it points toward, if anything, there is some evidence that we're kind of pulling together here. There's a reversal, that reversal happens to coincide exactly with um, the death of George Floyd and, and a new set of concerns coming onto the policy agenda. Um, but I think that's interesting suggestive e evidence. At a minimum, we don't see any rise in effective polarization that seems associated with COVID. So I'll stop there. I, I think the, the data suggests that these partisan differences in response are real. It also suggests that their size is moderate. And I think that's a really important message to remember. I think if, if the, the image we get from the media dramatically exaggerates these differences, and we have pictures in mind of, oh, in all the Republican areas, people are going to bars with no masks on and, and you know, having big protests and going to Trump rallies, that's not what most people are doing. Um, and if anything, polarization has been lower than before. Thanks. Thank you very much, Matt, for this terrific presentation. And, uh, and next, I'm happy to introduce uh, Erin Mordecai. Erin is an assistant professor in the biology department, a faculty fellow in the Center for Innovation in Global Health and the King Center for Global Development, as well as a member of uh, BioX. Erin's research centers on how human impacts on the environment affect infectious disease dynamics, including effects of climate and land use change uh, on malaria, Zika, and other vector-borne diseases. In 2019, Erin was named as Early Career Fellow in the Ecological Society of America. Erin is also an amazing teacher. She has received the Walter, the Walter Gores Award, which is a huge honor as this is Stanford's highest award for teaching. Erin is an inspiring example of someone who basically dropped everything else she was doing and focused her attention on the pandemic. It was incredible for me to watch how much effort and care Erin and her team put into building valuable and useful tools to the general public, for example, an interactive tool to simulate the effect of social distancing measures on the spread of COVID-19. So welcome, Erin, and thank you very much for being here. Thank you so much, Ron. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here, and thank you, everyone who's attending today. Um, I'm excited to share with you today some of the research that my lab has been doing in the last six months to try to use mathematical models to understand COVID-19 epidemic dynamics and also how non-pharmaceutical interventions can affect COVID control. Some of you may have heard this quote last week from the CDC director talking about how it may actually be said that face masks are more guaranteed to protect him against COVID than the vaccine itself. And of course, this was a controversial comment that led to a lot of blowback. But I think the point he's making here is that we shouldn't underestimate the importance of non-pharmaceutical interventions like masks and social distancing. But what's been really challenging about understanding the impact of non-pharmaceutical interventions is it's hard to understand what their role is, particularly when everything is changing all at the same time. So Matt just gave some great examples of how polarization and behavior are changing. So how do we tease apart the effects of social distancing on epidemic dynamics? 
And to do that, a group of people from my lab, primarily led by these three fantastic postdocs and students, have built some epidemiological models to try to understand how epidemic dynamics are changing over space and time and how interventions are impacting those dynamics. Um, and all this work that I'm going to present is publicly available on Morgan's GitHub repository. So the modeling framework that we're using here is what's called a compartmental epidemiological model, or you may have heard about an SIR model. And the framework here is that you take your host population and you divide them up with respect to the disease. So people are either susceptible, exposed, but not infectious yet, infectious, so they're able to infect others, and then they can become either recovered or they can die from the illness. And our model takes a few additional complexities because we know for COVID-19 it's possible to transmit the pathogen before you actually feel symptoms, and some people never actually feel symptoms. So we break up our infectious compartment into pre-symptomatic and asymptomatic, and then those pre-symptomatic people can become severe or mild, and those severely symptomatic people can become hospitalized and eventually either die or recover. So this is the kind of fundamental framework that we're working within. And then kind of the art and science of this is really trying to understand what are the rates that govern how people transition between these different compartments. And one of the really important things we're trying to estimate is the transmission rate within the population. Now you may have started hearing about this epidemiological concept called r naught or the basic reproduction number. It's really important to understand this because it gives us a benchmark for how much the epidemic is being controlled or not. So r naught is the average number of secondary infections produced by a single infected individual when they're introduced into a fully susceptible population. So we were thinking about r naught and talking about r naught quite a bit in March, for example, when very few infections had occurred yet in the United States and there were no control measures in place. There's a related idea called the effective reproduction number, or RE, which is the average number of secondary infections in a population with interventions in place and with some level of immunity. So now we're talking a lot more about the effective reproduction number, but in the case of both R0 and RE, the really, the really important threshold that we're considering is one, because if each infected person is infecting fewer than one other person on average, then your epidemic is gonna be declining. So R0 and RE give us this threshold for understanding whether the epidemic is under control or not. Now, notice that I'm highlighting the word average in both cases because um, R0 and RE are important average metrics, but within epidemiology, we also have come to understand the importance of super spreading, which is basically the concept that there's a huge amount of variation among individuals in how many secondary cases they cause. At this point, a lot of people have heard about examples of this on cruise ships or bars or weddings or funerals. But the concept is that for COVID-19 and other respiratory pathogens, there's a very skewed distribution of how many secondary cases each person causes. So here I'm showing the distribution over a four hour time step per individual. So on average, most people infect no one at all during a four hour period. A few people infect one or two people and very rare people will infect 20 or 30 or 40 people over a four hour period. And that's the phenomenon that we kind of loosely call super spreading is, is these events or short term periods where a single person is able to infect many others. So Keeping these concepts in mind, we're now gonna use this model to address a few questions. First, how does transmission vary over time and space? Second, how have interventions affected transmission rates? How predictable are epidemic dynamics? And how can super spreading and averting super spreading help us to control the epidemic? So what we did is we took this epidemiological model and we fit it to data from 200 different counties across the country, including the cell phone based mobility data from SafeGraph that Matt mentioned a minute ago, as well as the reported cases and deaths. And the model accounts for the fact that we're understanding that cases are underreported in these counties. So these counties vary quite a bit in their dem demographics, their socioeconomic status, their po political affiliations and their early policy decisions. And just to give you sort of a sense of how much these epidemic dynamics can vary, I'm just highlighting a few examples here. Um, I'm showing the counties highlighted in yellow, blue, and green on the map as well. So New Jersey, El Paso, Texas, and Santa Clara County, California. What we can see here, the black is the number of cases in the middle panel and the number of deaths on the bottom panel. That's what the black points are. And the colored bands represent the model simulations. This is a stochastic model that allows for some random variation. But what we can see is that the model is able to capture a wide variety of epidemic dynamics that we observed across the country using these just as some examples. 
So next we want to use the model to ask how have interventions affected transmission rates and how predictable are these epidemic dynamics. So here I'm showing just one example, one sort of arbitrary example of what epidemic dynamics look like over time on the top panel. And again, in black points, we're showing the data. And in the colored lines, we're showing the model prediction. In the second panel, I'm showing the effective reproduction number that the model estimates over time. And we can kind of break the epidemic into these four phases. The blue represents the early phase of the epidemic where we had uncontrolled spread followed by the kind of rapid decline during the, the control period. The orange represents the control period where our effective is below one. The green represents the resurgence period that happened in most, of, in most places in the country in the summer. And the black represents an out of sample period. So this is a period where we're not using the data to inform the model. We're just projecting the model forward to see if the model can do a good job of predicting what happened. So first, how have interventions affected transmission rates? Here I'm showing a distribution of the effective reproduction number. During the early epidemic phase in blue, we can see that on average across these 200 counties, the effective reproduction number was around two, but it went as high as five or even 10 in some of these counties. And during the control phase in sort of March through May or so, we saw a really dramatic decline in the effective reproduction number. So that's shown in orange here. We can see that on average, most places declined to about 0.8 or even lower than that. So a really dramatic impact of the interventions that happened in March and April and May. Then during the resurgence period shown here in green, we see that most places had their effective reproduction number climbing above one, but it's only climbing to about 1.25 or so, in contrast to the two or five or 10 that we saw prior to any epidemic restrictions. So what we can see is that even though there was a resurgence, that resurgence was more mild than the original epidemic. Next, we want to just ask how predictable are these epidemic dynamics? Here I'm showing the predicted cases on the y-axis versus the observed cases on the x-axis for the early epidemic phase across these 200 counties. And we can see very high predictability here. So this is really reassuring because although this epidemic has been unprecedented within most of our lifetimes in terms of the scope and scale of the impact it's had on our lives, the simple epidemiological models that we're using are actually able to capture those epidemics dynamics, even though they vary quite a lot over space. And we can see this if we look across all four phases of the epidemic. And in fact, even if we look at the part of the epidemic that's out of sample, where we're not actually observing the data in the model, we can still see, still see very strong predictability in the cases. In the bottom row, I'm showing you the deaths. So again, observed versus predicted. And again, we have fairly strong predictability, although it's somewhat lower than the predictability of cases. So epidemics were highly predictable during the early first wave control, resurgence, and one month ahead period. So this gives us some reassurance that the models are actually capturing what's going on and that there was an impact of the non-pharmaceutical interventions in bringing our effective below one initially and then slightly above one during the resurgence period. So finally, can averting superspreading control the epidemic? Again, here's our distribution of the four hour time window and how many other individuals each person is infecting. And the intervention we're thinking of here is simply chopping the tail. So we make it impossible for someone to infect 20 or 30 or 40 others over a four hour period simply by not allowing large gatherings indoors. So to show an example for LA here, we have the, the daily cases reported in black points and the model prediction in the lines. And these are some different possible interventions that we could look at starting around the 1st of July. One is just lift all interventions completely. That's the blue. There, of course, we would see a really rapid and dramatic resurgence of, of infection and we'd see thousands of deaths and tens of thousands of cases. If we continue the shelter in place, which was bringing our effective lower, but not below one, we'd see sort of a continued gradual kind of trickling in of cases. If we were able to increase testing to the point that we were we were detecting and isolating 90% of all symptomatic infections before they were able to infect others. That's what's shown in green. We can see that that would actually start to bring the epidemic under control. But interestingly, averting super spreading, even the top 0.5% of transmission events with only 75% accuracy was the strongest intervention that we saw here in this comparison of four. And that really quickly brought uh, control to the epidemic. So the key points here are that epidemic dynamics are variable, and yet they're predictable using these simple epidemiological models across space and time. 
Of course, it's really important to state that continued interventions are going to be needed. Probably even after we have a vaccine, continued non-pharmaceutical interventions like masks and social distancing are going to be important, at least until we can get the, the vaccine broadly distributed, depending on how effective the va vaccine is. And then finally, averting super spreading by not allowing large indoor gatherings is one of the most powerful interventions that we have to fight COVID-19. So thank you very much. That was really great. Thank you so much, Erin. And, and our last speaker is Marshall Burke. Marshall is an associate professor in the Department of Earth, Earth System Science and the deputy director of the Center on Food Security and the Environment. Marshall is also a faculty research fellow at the National Bureau of Economic Research and at CIPER. Uh, Marshall's research focuses on social and economic impacts of environmental change and on measuring and understanding economic livelihoods across the developing world. His work uh, regularly appears in both economics and scientific journals, including recent, recent publications in Nature, Science, and the Quarterly Journal of Economics. One of Marshall's recent research projects points to reductions in air pollution due to COVID-19 in China, highlighting the hidden costs of what our economy does to the environment and to our health outcomes when there is no pandemic. Marshall pointed out that his personal carbon footprint is down 80% this year, given all the travel canceled, which is a happy outcome, especially for someone who studies climate change. Uh, Marshall is also the co-founder of Atlas AI, a startup using satellites and machine learning to measure livelihoods. And so welcome, Marshall, and thank you so much for being here. Great. Thanks a lot, Ron. Uh, it's great to be here. And, and thanks for all the work you guys have put in organizing this awesome event. I'm, I'm glad I could, uh, could participate. Share my slides. Excellent. Okay, so this is a pretty hard uh, set of acts to follow. Um, and so let me motivate this uh, or try to motivate, motivate this by convincing you you should care. So you've heard about voting, you've heard about polarization, you've heard about disease dynamics. Those seem like the obvious things we think about with COVID. Why should we even be talking about the environment or specifically about air pollution, which is what I wanna talk about uh, today. Who cares? Um, so I'm gonna show you two pieces of evidence um, that, that this actually matters, that the environment actually matters for COVID and vice versa. Um, and the first has to do with uh, what air pollution might do and what it is doing to outcomes uh, in the COVID epidemic. So we have evidence now, I'll show you in a moment, uh, that air pollution uh, can and does increase uh, infection uh, rates and infection severities uh, in the COVID. Uh, epidemic. Um, and that's important if you live in the Bay Area. So here's a beautiful shot, uh, midday San Francisco a few weeks ago. So if you've been in the Bay Area over the last month, uh, we have witnessed some of the, if not the worst air pollution uh, on record uh, in this part of the state. And this was not just in uh, this part of California, it was felt up and down the West Coast. So we are living right now with terrible air pollution. Um, and this uh, actually has consequences for other disease outcomes that we care about. Um, the Stanford Daily had their own take on this. Uh, this was actually from last year. This was brilliant. Stanford students saved money on Juul by just walking outside amid wildfires. Pretty funny article. I encourage you to check it out. Uh, sad at the same time. I don't know if anyone still vapes. This was maybe funny a year ago. Uh, I, I still found it funny um, today. Um, okay, so air pollution could increase COVID severity. Um, and as Ron mentioned, the flip side of that is the uh, very severe shutdowns uh, that we took in this country and especially in other countries, lockdowns, um, actually had a large hidden benefit. Uh, they reduced air pollution. And because air pollution matters for a range of health, health outcomes, including outcomes in the COVID epidemic, these shutdowns actually had a likely unintended but pretty large hidden benefit. And so we've done a little bit of work to try to quantify what that hidden benefit uh, of these necessary shutdowns was. So I'll show you some evidence of that as well. Okay, so first, how can air pollution affect or does air pollution affect uh, COVID severity? Is it doing anything to affect the trajectory of the epidemic? Okay, so here's the first story or the first hypothesis and it's about long-term exposure to dirty air. So there's decades of work saying that long-term exposure to dirty air leads to worse health outcomes, respiratory outcomes, cardiovascular outcomes, um, basically any sort of health outcome we can study is negatively affected by long-term exposure to air pollution. 
So the idea is if you are exposed to dirty air for a long time, you have overall worse health, and this makes you more susceptible to getting infected or to having a worse outcome if you do get infected. Okay, so that's the claim. How would we actually study this? It turns out this is a pretty tricky question to evaluate. So again, here's the story. You have long run pollution exposure. This affects your overall uh, health and this affects your likelihood of getting infected or your outcome if you are affected. Okay, so why is that a challenge? So here I'm showing you a map of average air pollution. This is, think of this as sort of long-term air pollution in the US. Um, and one thing to note here is actually we're pretty lucky in the US. We have very good air quality in the US, which has actually gotten substantially better over the last two decades, mainly because of, of legislation, the Clean Air Act being the, being the main reason. Um, that said, there's still substantial variation in how dirty uh, or how clean the air is across the country. So here in the red areas, you see higher levels of key pollutants. This is PM 2.5, PM is particulate matter. 2.5 is the size, so it's 2.5 microns in diameter, which is 1 30th of a human hair. We always compare it to a human hair. I'm not sure why, but that's the comparison. So these are really tiny things. They get down into your lungs, they cross into your bloodstream, they wreak havoc uh, throughout your body, causing inflammation. Um, so what you can see here is uh, you see very uh, sort of stark geographic patterns in air quality. Um, and so if you're trying to figure out if long-term pollution exposure affects COVID outcomes, you have to grapple with the fact that average air pollution is correlated with a lot of other things that can also affect your overall health. So for instance, I grew up in Arkansas in the South. Arkansas has worse average air quality. You can see it here in, in orange and red. Uh, but it's also different in many other ways that might also affect our health. People tend to exercise less. We eat different things. Um, and that might also affect COVID outcomes. So this is a very tricky empirical problem, separating pollution from all these other things that could affect our health or could affect uh, COVID outcomes. Um, okay, so what studies try to do is, is basically what Matt gave you a taste of in the polarization example earlier. They try to control in a regression in a statistical analysis for all these other things that could be correlated with long-term air pollution. And again, this is really hard to do. Um, I think this gets us most of the way, but probably not all of the way to, a, to an estimate that we might believe. But what these studies find is yes, indeed, long-term exposure to average air pollution substantially worsens outcomes in the COVID epidemic. So the estimates in the literature are that um, you see for a one microgram increase in this really bad pollutant, you see a 10 to 15% increase in deaths, right? And we see like a 10 microgram difference across location, right? So this predicts very large differential mortality just due to air pollution alone. And that's a very, very large effect. So again, I think we should take these estimates with a little bit of a grain of salt. They're imperfect, um, but they're at least strongly suggestive that air pollution matters uh, for these outcomes that we care about. Um, okay, here's the second story, and this is more relevant for the wildfires that we've experienced recently. So again, the Bay Area has very, very good air quality uh, until it doesn't, right? Until we get these wildfires that blow in that dramatically reduce our air quality for weeks and, and now months uh, in, in the Bay Area. So here the story is somewhat similar, but instead of long-term exposure, we're thinking short-term exposure, okay? This is also tricky. So short-term exposure, affects health outcomes, and this again affects whether we get infected or how severe the infection is. Um, and here the problem is slightly different. Um, so what happened when uh, we started responding to the epidemic? So we had economic shutdowns. The purpose of these shutdowns was to reduce viral transmission and thus improve COVID outcomes. What they did at the same time was actually reduce air pollution, right? We shut down economic activity, we reduce air pollution. Um, and the plot on the right here shows this very clearly for China. Uh, the story here was very stark. Uh, air pollution improved by about 25%. Uh, so here are the estimated coefficients you can see on the x-axis or the y-axis are in AQI units. This is a measure I think people have become familiar with in the last few weeks. But these are very, very large improvements in air quality due to the economic shutdown. Okay, so you have a shutdown that directly affects the outcomes you care about. They also affect short-term pollution exposure. And so then you're not sure whether it's the pollution exposure or the shutdown that's causing the changes in the COVID outcomes. Okay, but here we have a better shot because it's not just the shutdowns that's causing changes in air pollution. We have other stuff happening. Wildfires being a great example that I just showed you. That's been more recent. We have dust from Africa that blows in. If you remember that from earlier in the summer, the wind blows it around and you have other policy changes that shift air pollution independently. Um, so this is something we're working on with the wildfires and the dust from Africa. Others have done this. 
Um, and the estimates from both the US and from EU settings in which this has been studied is again that short term increases in PM have often very, very large effects on both uh, case counts and the severity of COVID infections, including deaths uh, in the US and, and in Germany. Um, and this is consistent with evidence from other viruses, influenza being the main one, that worsening air pollution uh, worsens uh, respiratory infections. And again, we're working on the wildfires link. I was hoping to have a, a good estimate for you today, but uh, it, it wasn't ready. Um, okay, so in the short term, if it looks like this, uh, please, please stay inside, both for your overall health uh, and your health within uh, this COVID epidemic. So in the last minute or two, let me look at the flip side. Um, which is the potential unexpected benefits we got from these shutdowns. So here's the graph of China again, the air quality improvements in China. Again, a very severe lockdown in many Chinese cities and a very dramatic improvement in air quality as a result. Okay, uh, and here's the satellite view of it. So if you want to see, so we can measure lots of these pollutants from satellites, which is pretty cool. Uh, the plot, the satellite view on the left here is early January. The one on the right is early February, and basically you can see these really, really dramatic and rapid increases in, in air quality. Okay, we've got a lot of papers that tell us how changes in air quality affect health outcomes. Um, and so we calculated, okay, under normal circumstances, what would have been the health benefit of this air quality improvement? And in China alone, we calculate about 50,000 lives would have been saved, mainly among the old and the very young, from these two-month air quality improvements. Um, so again, these are short-term air quality improvements, but they have demonstrable and large effects on health. Okay, so that's about an order of magnitude larger than the reported COVID deaths in China. So we shouldn't think the conclusion is not that pandemics are good for our health. The conclusion is that there were additional benefits of these very tough actions, these economic shutdowns that we, that we took, uh, additional benefits in terms of improved air quality and, uh, and better health. Okay. So what are the lessons? Air pollution is really bad, worse than we thought. Um, short run changes in air pollution and long run changes likely worse than the COVID epidemic. Still some work to be done on that. Um, and I think these shutdowns actually had unexpected benefits through this environmental channel uh, that, that we should take seriously. So thanks. Great, thank you very much, Marshall. That was fascinating. And uh, as participants are now submitting the questions using the Q&A function, let, let me maybe start by asking you all just one question to get, start, to get us started. So you all talked about various challenges posed by COVID-19, and some of you mentioned what policymakers can potentially do about these challenges. I, I wonder if any of you have thoughts about uh, what the folks attending the event today can do to help address some of these challenges, for example, to make the elections run more smoothly or reduce super spreading or, or any thoughts uh, that you, you may have. And maybe we, maybe we can start with, with Pamela. So uh, the two suggestions I'd make to people about what they can do is, uh, if you can vote early, vote early. Uh, if you're worried about the security of your ballot, you can drop it off. Uh, many states have drop boxes and other places. You can drop it off at the county office building. Uh, and if you're capable of uh, volunteering to be a poll worker in the jurisdiction where you're registered, uh, you should do that. And you can go to powerthepolls.org uh, to find out how to do that. Great. Anybody else want to weigh in? Matt, do you want to say something about this? Mm, I, I think on the, on the polarization topic, I would just say, kind of reemphasize the second side of the coin I was talking about, which is not to exaggerate these differences and not to exaggerate the magnitude of, of polarization in this crisis. I think one of the things we know from the literature long before COVID is people's perceptions of polarization dramatically overstate the reality of polarization. And what we tend to do is, is when, when we think of people on the other side, whatever that other side is, we imagine somebody who is a very extreme archetype we think about COVID, we think about Republican areas, we imagine all these people going to bars with no masks and holding huge events and um, saying they don't care about this at all or they don't believe in social distancing. That is not the typical Republican, that is not the 90th percentile Republican, that's like a very, very, very extreme behavior that gets amplified by the media and amplified by what's put in front of us. And I think, you know, in the reverse direction too, when people think about liberal areas. So. I think all of us can help things a lot by 
checking those tendencies in ourselves and really remembering most people out there look a lot more similar to us than, than we imagine based on what we see. Erin? Yeah, um, I would say, I guess my advice is gonna mirror the public health guidelines right now, but I think what we're starting to understand about how SARS-CoV-2 is spread is that it's spread primarily through aerosols and droplets that come out when we speak. And so wearing masks, even cloth masks can be really powerfully protective and avoiding indoor spaces and especially poorly ventilated indoor spaces wherever we can. Um, so I think, you know, we are going to be in this for the long haul. It's going to be a while before there's enough of us that can get vaccinated that this really won't be a problem anymore. And so I think getting used to the types of kind of longer term lifestyle changes that we can make. We're so fortunate, those of us living in California right now with the good air quality that we can spend so much time outside and we can do so many of our activities outside. Um, and again, because super spreading is such a powerful driver, it makes epidemics really erratic, but it also makes it so that if we can kind of chop that tail and, you know, not go into a room with 50 other people, that goes a really long way towards control. So we don't have to completely, you know, be back in lockdown mode, but we can make these kind of small steps in our everyday lives, including especially the wearing masks and the, you know, maintaining distance and staying outside. Marshall? Yeah, uh, please don't start wildfires. Uh, that's a that's a big good place to start. Um, that the masks I think can help with air pollution overall, except uh, most studies show that we need the sort of stronger A95 masks. Those are hard to get. We need them for frontline health workers, and so that's not going to be a viable strategy for a lot of folks. The indoor outdoor thing is the challenge here because when the air pollution is really bad, you want to be indoors almost for sure. Um, if you're indoors by yourself, that's fine. If you're indoors with other person, then that's exactly contrary to what Aaron just said. So this is a really tricky challenge in a setting in which we have terrible air quality. So if there's good air quality, please go outside. If there's bad air quality, stay inside by yourself. Don't light fires. I Don't can just bathe. add that, you know, this is the problem that Stanford, those who have their kids in daycare at Stanford is, is wrestling with right now, because in order to have the daycares open safely, they have the windows and doors open. And then when the air quality gets terrible, they have to send everybody home basically. So I think that is a horrible catch 22 that we're in right now. That's yeah, great answers. Not not all very happy, but uh, that's the situation we are in. But this is great. So let, let's turn to questions from the audience, and this is an opportunity for me to showcase some of our impressive graduate students. So today I ask Nina Brooks to moderate the Q and A. Nina is a PhD candidate in the Emmet Interdisciplinary Program in Environment and Resources. Her research examines how environmental factors, particularly air pollution, affect human health, as well as how women's lives are affected uh, by reproductive health access. So thanks a lot, Nina, for joining and for moderating the Q&A from the audience today. Thanks so much, Ron, and also thanks to all the professors. This was really interesting. Um, so the first question that we have is for Professor Carlin. Given that elections are administered lar largely at the local level, what can state and local governments do to ensure that vote by mail and other procedures are accessible in spite of obstruction that we've seen from the USPS and the federal government? So, um, you know, the secretaries of state can send out uh, information uh, to the local election authorities. They can provide training. Um, one of the things that's difficult is that, you know, local governments are already under a lot of fiscal pressure uh, and it takes money to, to run an election. Um, so, you know, there's, there's attempts to persuade and then in a lot of places now you're seeing litigation, there are 250 lawsuits somewhere in the country or another uh, involving the upcoming election. Uh, and a lot of those are connected with COVID related issues like uh, making sure that uh, ballots get counted even if they come back late uh, or opening uh, polling places early or the like. Thank you. Um, the next question is for Matthew Jenskow. So Erin Mordecai in her presentation illustrated the substantial impact of super spreading events. How does your research on political polarization correlate with sentiments toward large indoor gatherings? That's a great question. So we don't have any direct evidence um, on, on people going to very large gatherings in our data. I think it's something that, that 
you could try to explore more with the GPS data, uh, trying to find indicators of, of those really large gatherings. I think on surveys, when people are asked things about like going to large parties, um, the pattern is similar, that there is some, some difference, but, but maybe not enormous. Um, it's also good to remember, I think there are other characteristics, which at least anecdotally are very correlated with those things like age, for example, I think is a, probably a much stronger predictor right now of who is going to very large, you know, large parties and large gatherings. So I don't think, I don't think, although there is some correlation with party, I think that's probably not unique in, in this. Thank you. Um, the next question is for Professor Mordecai. Uh, what do you say to people who doubt the power of mask wearing uh, or point to evidence that they might not even be that effective? Maybe this will say something uh, Matt can touch on too. Yeah, um, the mask wearing issue has been a tricky one, especially in the United States, because you know I remember even in February and March myself feeling very uncertain about whether masks were useful, especially cloth masks. Um, and you know we'd already seen at that point a big cultural difference in terms of who was wearing masks in kind of just general social settings. Um, and I think the countries that were really hard hit by SARS-CoV-1 back in 2003 had adopted these kind of cultural changes where people are willing to wear masks in public, you know, on airplanes or when they're out traveling. And it took a long time for people in the US as a majority to adopt that in part because the guidance was really confusing at the beginning. There's some discussion that, you know, that the, the guidance that initially told people not to wear masks was around trying to keep people from going on a run on masks, just like there was with toilet paper and hand sanitizer so that, you know, healthcare professionals would have access to them. And that's still, you know, a really important factor is, you know, having masks in the facilities that are highest risk. Um, and I think you know, as fundamental as the idea of a mask is, I don't think there had been quite enough research up until it became totally essential to have that research to understand, you know, what does a mask actually do? You know, there have been people, you know, physicists who are studying how the droplets that come out of your mouth are intercepted by a mask. Initially, so after people started being told to wear masks, the guideline was that it's to protect others, but not to protect you. And now we're even starting to have some evidence that even a cloth mask can protect you in addition to protecting others. Um, and one of the benefits that is maybe talked about a little bit less, yes, a mask can keep you from getting you know, virus particles at all. But if you do get exposed to virus particles, let's say you're talking closely with someone with a cloth mask and some of it gets through, your dose of the virus is going to be lower. And there's evidence, kind of circumstantial evidence from animal studies and things like that, that, you know, the lower of the do the lower the dose of virus that you're exposed to, the more likely your immune system will be able to fight it off. So I think at this point, the evidence is really solid. But unfortunately, during that period, when there was uncertainty about the guidelines and the evidence, there was also a lot of polarization that happened around masks. And so, you know, I'd love to hear from a psychologist who studies this sort of thing, but I think it's this very clear signal also about, you know, I'm taking this problem seriously, or I have a particular belief or affiliation and I can wear it right on my, fa on my face. So um, I've been very encouraged to see locally here that almost everybody is wearing masks now, even when they're outside. Um, and I, I think that's at this point very well supported by the evidence. Um, thank you so much. Um, the next question we have is for Marshall about the correlation between air pollution and inequality in the United States and the effects on COVID. Um, so we know that air pollution rates are higher in parts of the South and also so were the rates of COVID deaths that we saw. And so this person is wondering if maybe the higher death rate among people of color could be explained by air pollution exposure. Yeah, thanks. And that's a really excellent question. And I think uh, right on. So yeah, so the basic stylized fact um, is that uh, lower income individuals and minority individuals tend to be exposed at higher levels to a range of pollutants, including PM 2.5, the one I showed. Um, and so if you take the higher end of those numbers from the effect of long term air pollution exposure on COVID related outcomes, and those do suggest that these differences in average exposure across racial groups, socioeconomic groups, can go a long way to explaining differential outcomes uh, within the COVID epidemic. Again, I think we want to be a little cautious in, um, in completely trusting these long-term estimates, but, but yeah, right now they would suggest that a lot of the differential effects could be, or at least are consistent with differential air pollution exposure. Yeah, so great, great question. Thanks. 
Um, this next question is for, I guess, all or any of the panelists. And it's, do you think wearing masks will become more normalized after COVID-19 isn't a, you know, urgent problem anymore, perhaps during flu season or other outbreaks um, when people are sick? I guess for anyone who wants to jump in and take it. I think so, um, based on what I was just saying and, and based on the fact that we saw countries that were most hard hit by SARS-CoV-1 sort of broadly adopting mask wearing as a sort of social practice, and I hope so. Yeah, I would say, I think, I think it's actually really interesting to think about, uh, on the one hand, for sure, having done this at large scale is gonna potentially normalize it. On the other hand, as we were just saying, it's become such a, such a partisan symbol and I, I think that, you know, one thing to remember about masks as related to what Aaron was saying, it's like, it's a very visible, very social thing. How comfortable people feel doing that, I think varies dramatically with whether other people around them are doing it. Um, and we also, there were, there were big cultural differences already in, in the kind of how, how common that was. And so, you know, in different parts of the world, it, it was common or not common and how, how comfortable people felt varied a lot. So it, it's, it's really, I mean, it's easy to imagine that, that it does become much more widespread in general. It's easy to imagine it continues to have some kind of partisan divide because it's, it's become so symbolic. So even wearing a mask during flu season is some kind of political, you know, badge. Um, I don't know how it's, how it's gonna play out, but it seems really interesting. So our next question is, I guess, also for, for Pam and for Matt. Uh, do you think polarization in the perception of COVID-19 health risk will impact voting behavior, especially in states where in-person voting is the norm? So there's a very real question about this, um, you know, whether, uh, whether COVID is driving things on people's unlikelihood to show up, for example, to vote in person, or whether it's their belief in fraud, which comes out of a different kind of piece of the polarization, which is the polarization, you know, President Trump announces that the election is fraudulent, that voting by mail is fraudulent. Then he says, well, it's not all voting by mail, it's just if the state sends it to you. There's a lot of discussion on the election law list serve about the extent to which the state parties are, are the state Republican parties are a little upset with this because they think it will drive down uh, the voting by Republican, older Republican voters who don't want to go to the polls. So it's, re you know, there's so much swirling around here, it's really hard to figure out in what order the effects go. And then, of course, a lot of it depends on people's motivation to vote. And that may be shifting in a whole lot of ways, um, just as, as, the, as the situation changes. I don't think many people are changing their mind about which candidate they support. The question is really one about how likely uh, they are to vote. And the one thing we know right now is at least the polling data suggests a much higher percentage of Democrats plan to vote by mail than Republicans nationwide. But uh, I haven't seen the data on individual states. And as probably most of you folks know, because of the way the Electoral College determines the outcome of the election, uh, rather than the national popular vote, it matters almost as much what's going to happen in the battleground states um, as, as nationwide. Yeah, just uh, the only thing I would add on top of all of that is, you know, the course of the COVID crisis, as Aaron's data showed, has been incredibly uneven across space and across time. And so really depends a lot on what's going on in November. You know, if you were, if it looks like New York in April, going out to vote feels like a, and is genuinely a tremendous risk. If it feels like, you know, San Francisco right now, probably not so much. So it's, that impact could depend a lot on the course of the virus over, over these next couple of months. Yeah, can I ask you, can I ask, can I ask you a question, Matt? Which is, what do you make of, there was an interesting uh, NBR paper about a surge in COVID in Wisconsin right after the debacle in the primary where a lot of people didn't get their vote by mail ballot, so they showed up and voted. And in the counties with more in-person voting, two weeks later, there seemed to be a bunch more COVID. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I haven't looked really, really closely at the details of that to, to, to weigh in on 
how convincing it is, but it se those results seem to me when I saw them very plausible and you know, it relates to the super spreader phenomenon and um, just that, that particularly at that, at that point in time when there were the baseline, there was a lot of social distancing, the, the transmission risk was pretty high. Voting is an example of genuinely bringing a lot of people together indoors in a way that could, could, could plausibly, and, and I think the evidence in that paper suggests non-trivial spreading as a result. Yeah. Um, next question is for Marshall. So a few people would suggest that locking down entire economies is an effective strategy to combat either air pollution or climate change. Um, but they could take the sort of the lockdowns as evidence that the only way to control these environmental problems is to just completely sacrifice the economy. Um, do you see this as a moment to, I guess, seize um, in terms of getting more aggressive climate policies or maybe the other direction? Yeah, it's a, it's a great and interesting question. Um, no, I don't think we should be pursuing economic lockdowns as a general strategy. I think this was a, a you know, the, the only one of the only tools at our disposal given the epidemic. Um, it is interesting to think about um, what were the effects on environmental outcomes that we care about. So we saw dramatic increases in air quality. The climate side is quite interesting. So the numbers right now suggest a about a eight to ten percent decline in CO two emissions. Um, for this year in the US and in the EU. So it turns out that's about what we need every single year to meet the more aggressive uh, mitigation targets, climate mitigation targets under the Paris Agreement. Um, so that's sort of tough to swallow, I think, uh, because I think this to many people seemed like a very dramatic step. And I think what it suggests is uh, we need other ways to do this, right? Uh, our tool is not an economic shutdown. Our tool is to, you know, incentivize in other ways the sort of changes we want to see and invest in the technologies that allow us to do this in a cost-effective way. Um, I think there's a lot of evidence that, that that's happening pretty quickly. Um, a lot of renewable technologies are getting cheaper very quickly. Today's battery day, I know Tesla's announcing all sorts of new cheap batteries today. So it's moving in the right direction um, and hopefully it will move fast enough and, and with the right policy steps, it could move even faster in a way that um, will not require economic shutdown to, to achieve these goals. Thank you. Um, for Professor Mordecai, what are some of the main challenges in COVID modeling and also what um, does your model currently say about the next few months in terms of where the um, COVID projections are going? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, Unfortunately, one of the biggest challenges has been just the lack of reliable data about COVID-19. And in fact, the first model that we built in my lab where we you know, made this publicly available tool where you could interact and, and play around with different social distancing tools was entirely based on COVID-19 death data because the case data were so unreliable at that point. We had no idea, you know, the you can sort of think of how reliable the case data are um, by thinking about how many tests are being performed, what proportion of them are positive, and how quickly are the results coming back. And at the beginning of the epidemic, it was so poor that you know, almost all the tests that were being run were coming back positive because only the most extremely sick people were being able to get tested. Um, and so that really hampered our response because first of all, it eliminated the tool of contact tracing and isolation and, and you know, made it impossible for us to kind of stop the spread before the cat got out of the bag everywhere. Um, that was a really big challenge. Fortunately, pretty quickly, publicly available sources of, of mobility data based on cell phones became available. So that's been a really important tool for us to use. Um, so now that the you know, testing has ramped up quite a bit in most places, so we can actually start to rely on the case data. Not that every case is being detected and reported, but at least that there's a consistent fraction of cases being reported over time. And so with the combination of cases, deaths, and mobility data, we can kind of put together the picture. Um, one of the things I had hoped to be able to present today, but I didn't present was, you know, what are the predictors across these 200 counties of why different places had different epidemic dynamics. And one of the challenges there is, you know, something that both Matt and Marshall talked about that, you know, everything is correlated with each other. So, you know, it can be difficult to control for all the possible confounding factors. And we do see some really strong, you know, 
predictable relationships where places with higher population sizes and population densities had larger initial epidemics and it took longer to get the epidemics under control. We do see kind of a, a promising result so far that I'm not sure I fully trust yet, but um, we found that the longer a shelter in place or stay at home order was in place, the longer that epidemic control period lasted. So suggesting that there is a relationship between policy and um, and, and epidemiological outcomes. But one of the big challenges has been trying to understand at a local and state level, what impact do these policy orders actually have compared to just sort of people hearing about it or, or reading about it, or, you know, it's it, the information that people are getting through their kind of informal sources. Um, so those have been some of the bigger challenges for us. Thank you so much. Um, and so this is the last question that we have time for today, and it's a question for Pam. So one thing that we're seeing with COVID is fewer students returning to campuses across the country and staying at home. Could this result in significant changes in voting outcomes, especially in smaller states like New Hampshire, where there's a often really large influence from student voters? So I think a lot more of it depends on where the student is registered to vote than where the student is on election day. Um, students, many students register to vote where they go to school, and if they were registered to vote where they went to school, they'd be entitled to get an absentee ballot from there, even if they're home in the same way that if I were, you know, guest teaching for the semester at a school on the East Coast, I would still get a California ballot. Um, it, you know, it might make a difference because turnout might be much lower uh, if they're not at school, so there's less of a get out the vote effort. Um, Mostly that has an impact on local elections where a couple of dozen votes can swing a seat. Um, it doesn't have as much of an impact on the national election or on statewide elections where, you know, even in a state like Wyoming, you're going to have a couple hundred thousand people voting. Well, what great and interesting set of questions, I have to say. And uh, thank you so much, Nina. And we will make available a list of further readings for the students and for those of you interested in delving more into some of the topics presented today. This was a really fascinating discussion and thank you so much Pamela and Matt and Erin and Marshall for your fabulous uh, presentation and great discussion. And uh, thank you all and see you next week. We will talk about uh, how the pandemic is changing the economy. Thanks everybody. <laughs>